Next up, we have our first midweek sortie of the season as we face AFC Bournemouth in the second round of the League Cup. Now, as ever, with sponsored stuff, this column's usual policy is that if someone wants me to advertise their product, I'll only mention them if they send me some free samples. However, when it comes to the League Cup, having once had the misfortune of tasting what it is that the sponsors actually make, I'd like to tell them in this case not to bother. Kick-off on Wednesday is at 7.45pm, and should the scores be level at full time, the match will proceed to kicks from the penalty mark without the traditional use of extra time first. So, Bournemouth then. It's played two and drawn two in the league so far, with 1-1 stalemates up at Forest and again on Sunday at home to Newcastle, who suspiciously were on the right end of some questionable refereeing once more. I'm guessing that anybody who works for PGMOL is usually OK for petrol these days. Bournemouth brought in seven players over the summer, a number that Daisy reckons is at the upper limit of the number she's willing to research before she asks for more money. When I say more money, I mean money. The first arrival came in the form of striker Enes Unal. Now, Unal netted twice in 16 league appearances last season whilst on loan from Getafe, to whom the Cherries paid £13 million in July to make the deal permanent. Mrs Unal is better known, well, in Belgium anyway, as Genk striker Lisa Smellers, who, if she's a traditionalist, might well have been grateful for the change of surname when they got married. Unal won't be about for this one. He's yet to make an appearance this season due to a foot-stroke ankle injury. Next in was young Kiwi keeper Alex Paulson, who came in for £850,000 from New Zealand outfit Wellington Phoenix. Now, I'm not sure that his work permit status would actually let him into play, but the question is somewhat academic, since he was immediately loaned back once he came. They kept the Commonwealth theme going in signing Canadian Daniel Jebison for £1.5 million worth of compensation from Sheffield United. Jebison has been capped by England up to under-20 level, but the country of his birth, Canada, are still keeping tabs on him, adding him to last year's CONCACAF Gold Cup squad, though he didn't actually make the final cut. Both of his appearances for Bournemouth this season have come off the bench. Somebody with the unusual name of Kobe Motto came in on a free from Pompey, but since he was signed as an under-21 player, Daisy refused to do any more digging, pointing out that she had enough to do with people who might play against us without throwing in those who almost certainly wouldn't. Spaniard Dean Hoyson arrived for £12.8 million from Juventus. Now I hear you saying Hoyson, Spaniard, and you'd be right. That Dutch-sounding surname is because he was born in Amsterdam. However, he moved to Spain at the age of five and, having potted around in the Malaga youth system, Juventus lured him eastwards at the age of 16 to slot into their youth system. He only made one league appearance for the old lady. No, no Daisy, that's not you. Uh, though he did have a baker's dozen of appearances for Roma on loan last season. He's still only 19 and the central defender has Dutch caps up to under 19 level. Since when he has shifted allegiance to the Spanish, for whom he has citizenship. He's made two appearances for the much lauded Spanish under-21 side. He started for Bournemouth up at Forest, but was, he was an unused sub against the Magpies this weekend. If their fans were coming to terms with Bournemouth signing a player from Juventus, they would have been in a similar state of disbelief at picking up a right-back from Barcelona. However, like Huyson with Juventus, the Mexican-American Julian Araujo's previous club was really only in name. Arajo made no league appearances for Barca, spending his time on their books out on loan in the Canaries with Las Palmas. It's a hard life, isn't it? He's another with split international allegiances. Born in California, he was capped at every age level for the Septics. He even made one full international appearance for the Americans before deciding things would be better south of the border down Mexico way and he's now made over a dozen appearances for the land of the now-defunct Aztec chocolate bar. He started against Newcastle and came off the bench against Forest. Their final signing to date was their biggest. £40.2 million was the fee he paid to Porto to bring Brazilian international Evan Ilson. 
into Dean Court. Perhaps unsurprisingly, that figures a club record. He's been capped twice by the full Brazilian squad, and he made his Cherries debut on Sunday, lasting about seven minutes before being hooked. That's all their signings sorted then. Let's move on, shall we, to the wild and wacky world of association football. Odd apology of the week came from Chelsea's Madueke, who went all contrite over a social media post to the effect that everything about Wolverhampton was, and I quote, shit. The apology was something along the lines of, I didn't mean to offend, which is a bit puzzling given the content of said post. Now, if he'd said, sorry, I meant what I said, but that was before I saw Croydon, and I now realise exactly how wrong I was, his apology would have at least made some sort of sense. Talking of Croydon, and note to editor, I charge more for seamless links like that, brings me neatly on to our win down in that godforsaken dump, and every offence intended. There was much improvement from the Villa match, as players got to grips much more with the system, more geared to our being on the front foot. Kilman in particular impressed, and he was much praised by the BBC, who, forgetting that he isn't actually a Liverpool player, described his part in the second goal as striding out like Baresi in his pomp. Juan Bissaka's part in the first goal should also be noted. Everyone's been telling me how good he is defensively, but it was his attacking game, which apparently he doesn't have, that caught the eye. He brought the ball out of defence down the line, and having found what looked like a blind alley, he remained calm before playing a lovely ball into the path of Bowen. There were two other points of note. Now, older readers may remember when the fad of fantasy football was at its height back in, well, around the mid-1990s, I guess. Frank Skinner and David Baddiel had a programme which, whilst ostensibly about the fantasy football league, was in reality more of a sporadically amusing look at the game in general. Part of this programme was entitled Phoenix from the Flames, where they would hop over to the local wreck and reenact famous goals or other scenes from matches from the past. Now, I have absolutely no idea as to whether or not they bothered with the case of Zaire's Mwewepu Ilunga's sole real contribution to fame, which was running out of the defensive wall in a 1974 World Cup group game to kick the ball away before opponents of Brazil could take a free kick, then looking puzzled as to why he was being booked. But if they didn't, Pacatar seemed intent on recreating the moment for them. In Pacatar's defence, it did look as if the ball had been touched, which would have enabled him to run away with the ball unimpeded. However, referee Jones, who spent all afternoon punishing perfectly good clean challenges, was having none of it, though he shied clear from issuing the yellow card that might have raised eyebrows amongst those currently investigating Pacatar. Ilunga, for the record, did say that his action had been a protest against the way the players' pay seemed to go missing between the Zaire FA and the players' bank accounts, and that he'd actually been hoping for a red. The other point of note was slightly more serious. We are, of course, aware that Palace's attitude to safety in the away section is somewhat lax, shall we say, with thoroughfares funneling large numbers of people into dangerously small spaces. Not for nothing is it referred to up and down the country as the death trap. The rest of the infrastructure seems to be a bit iffy as well. Now, as fans moved forward in celebration of our first goal, a gate collapsed and the resulting forward surge knocked over an advertising hoarding, trapping a ball boy. Thankfully, goal scorer Suchek saw it was happening and rescued the understandably shaken youngster from underneath the hoarding, where Bowen took over health and safety duties. Could have been a lot worse but for the players' quick thinking and the ball boy escaped with nothing more than injured pride and a wee bit of shock. Still, they've got a safety certificate, haven't they? So everything must be okay, mustn't it? Team news and the early return of Alvarez means that we've got a full squad to pick from for the first time since, well, probably since those astronauts got stranded in space. I would expect that, as is the modern way these days, some of the new boys will be given starts to get some game time and match fitness into legs and minds. Having said that, at present, that's a potentially strong second eleven we're looking at there. I watched Bournemouth at the weekend, and whilst they were definitely the better of the two sides in the first half, my theory was that that owed more to Newcastle's deficiencies than to their own attributes. The second half seemed to bear out that theory, and Bournemouth laboured to a draw in the end, the controversy over the disallowed goal distracting somewhat from their own shortcomings. So on this occasion I'll be keeping the £2 I was going to send to the ball boy. He's got Bowen's shirt now, which he can probably swap for a dozen Palace players, plus cash, and we don't want to spoil him, do we? 
and I'm going to be spending it on a wager for a home win. Make that 3-1 to us, please, Mr. Winston. Enjoy the game. <laughs> 